The things I've done that have succeeded the most were the ones that I thought had no chance of succeeding at all. So I thought, who's going to be interested in this? I mean, nobody's going to be interested in this except me. You know, it was one of those things that like, oh my God, if I fail at this, my whole life goes down in flames. If you don't do it, you get sick. It goes into your body. If you don't do it, that energy doesn't just dissipate. It goes into a darker channel. You have to have a very specific, no bullshit mindset to keep you going. And I want to make it clear to people how hard it's going to be and what exactly the pitfalls are so that when they come up against them, they don't freak out and they don't quit. We've covered a lot in our last few conversations on this podcast, but I always like to just give a little bit of a refresher for those people. Obviously, yeah. you're the author of The War of Art, but you're also, I think you're more passionate about writing fiction um, as opposed to nonfiction. Yeah, I am. And that yeah. really was a, that was a byproduct of just a conversation you had with your business partner. And um, so let, just talk a little bit about um, how you sort of introduce yourself these days. Oh, it's a good question. I'm not sure how I introduce myself. Uh, I mean, um, I started out, I mean, I've wanted to be a writer ever since I was, you know, in my 20s and uh, took, a, took a long time, but my, um, to get any success. And what I uh, really think of myself as is as a storyteller, you know, as a writer of fiction. Um, but the sort of the weird thing was I, kind of banged out this one little book about 20 years ago called The War of Art. And that's really about the, the, the creative process, nothing to do with uh, fiction or anything. And that's the one that I've sort of, that people kind of know me for, which is kind of frustrating to me. Um, Cause you know, you can never get anybody interested in fiction that you wrote. There's no way, you know, unless they find it themselves. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, if that's where, so then I, I've kind of followed up the war of art with, with a bunch of other stuff that's kind of in that same vein. Um, and, uh, I'm trying to sort of balancing between the two worlds, uh, and uh, the never the twain shall meet. How many copies of the war of art have sold? And I, I, I've heard you mention millions, but what, do you have a specific, like, range? I don't have a specific, but I know it passed a million, like a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't know. It's somewhere, somewhere that puts you in a there. very elite group of, of of storytellers. You know, having a book out there that's over the last however many decades has sold a million copies. Well, you know, it's sort of a, well. The one thing that really put it over the top was uh, I got invited on to Oprah Winfrey's show, mm -hmm. and that sort of got it into uh, escape velocity, and it's been. Knock wood, it's been kind of flying by itself since then. So, um, what was the Joe Rogan effect like? Because you've been on there. That as was well. a big. That was big too. But you yeah. know how it is, like like with Amazon or something like that. You can't really tell how right. many copies you're selling. You have no idea. I have no idea if you sell twenty a week or if you sell two thousand. I have no idea. Um, uh, but, well, uh, in the in the creative community, you are kind of like you're kind of known as like the David Goggins of. <laughs> of creativity or more specifically of writing in the sense that you take a pretty unrelenting uh, attitude towards showing up for the craft. And obviously you talk a lot about resistance with a capital R, but on the other side of that, you, you talk a lot about consistency as well. So wh why is consistency so important? I mean, I, don't you think life that it's true of everything? It's true of meditation, right? I mean, you would you would definitely say to anybody that you were teaching, right? You know, do it every day. You know, do it twice, three times, whatever. And I, I certainly, I'm I'm a real believer. I mean, if if we were training for the Olympics as runners, let's say, you're not going to take a week off. You can't take off three days. You know, you can't you can't even take part of a day off. You know, it's all got to be focused. Um, and I'm a believer, as you know, in the muse and the goddess, you know, that uh, that mysterious element that's sort of looking down each day uh, as you're meditating or as you're doing your work or whatever, the meditation gods. And every day that they see you there doing your thing, that strengthens the bond and strengthens the flow. 
So uh, I'm, I'm, you know, we're, we're not amateurs at this. We're not here to fuck around. We're here to do something. So just like an athlete or, or anybody, you know, it's, it's an everyday thing. No doubt. I mean, Stephen King writes on his birthday, Christmas, every day of the year. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out. And back to the show. I had an experience with this that really kind of... Uh, got me to the point where I, where I started to rely on this muse that you're, you're referring to. I didn't call it that when it first happened to me, but you've got this email called Writing Wednesdays. Obviously it comes out every Wednesday. I've got an email called The Daily Dose of Inspiration, which I started in 2016. And I remember being so afraid of taking on that commitment that I was gonna run out of content within, I don't know, three weeks. Because how many stories does any person know that, you know, have a clear beginning, middle and end, that's inspiring, that's, you know, that's, that's a clever anecdote. Probably, you know, I, I thought I had at least three weeks worth, but then I was gonna run out. And so I was very afraid to take on this commitment, but I took it on anyway. And sure enough, within three weeks, I ran out of content. And, what, and on the next night, I just, it was 11.45. The email had to go out at six o'clock. I had nothing because <laughs> I have this very high standard for myself. Like it's got to be the right message. Uh -huh. And I decided I'm just going to sit on the couch and close my eyes until something comes through. And I did that. I sat and, and I inadvertently meditated. I wasn't really intending to meditate, but I just uh -huh. closed my eyes. And because I've been meditating for so many years, I just dropped into this meditative state and Sure enough, within about 25 minutes or so, an idea bubbled up and I go, that's it. <laughs> and then that started happening. And it reminded me of this, this, this Maya Angelou quote where she says, you'll never, you'll never um, use up creativity because creativity generates creativity. And I think she's referring to, we're all referring to the same concept of this mirrors or this, this wave of inspiration that's sort of feeding us. And I realized at that point, and this was like 20, 2,500 emails ago, as I've been doing this now for seven years, that I didn't have to be responsible for what to write. I, would just, I just had to show up. And if I showed, if I did my part and showed up, then the muse was going to give me exactly what to do. And you had an experience where you wrote in your, in your most recent book that, um, you would take the Bhagavad Gita on airplanes and read it. Mm -hmm. And then that led to an idea. Talk, talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit about the Battle of Thermopolis and, and how that uh, also led to an idea. So these are um, just such so random. Let me, say, let me say one thought. thing first, like on that subject yeah. you were just talking about. There's a wonderful book I want to recommend called Improv Wisdom mm -hmm. by Patricia Madsen. Have you ever, have you heard of this book? No, not at all. It's a little book, kind of like The War of Art. And Patricia Madsen taught improv at Stanford for years. And it was like the class that everybody lined up around the block to get to see or to get to take. One of the exercises that she does was she would say, imagine that you're standing, you're on stage, you're doing improv, and you're holding a little white box and what the exercise is, you open the lid of the box and, and you tell everybody what's in it. And sometimes you'll open the lid and there'll be a tarantula in it. And you'll open it up the next time and there'll be a ham sandwich. But the trick, and you, you sort of spoo, you know, go off from there. But the trick is there's always something in the box. And so that's kind of like the muse in a way. It's like, it's like when you sat down, there, this, each time you open it, there's something there. And you ask yourself, well, where does it come from? But it's always there. So, you know, for whatever that means, there's this creative force that's, that's always, always there. So the Bhagavad Gita is this, uh, they sometimes call it the Hindu Bible. And it's, it's the equivalent for Hinduism. And, uh, it's, you know, it's scripture, but it's short. You know, you can read it in an hour. 
and it's kind of poetry. And I've just sort of, it's something I kind of fell in love with and, you know, as a young person. And uh, I always used to read it on airplanes because I thought if the plane crashes, you know, I, I want to be reading something spiritual at the time. And, uh, but the idea for the book and the movie, The Legend of Bagger Vance, came from that book, from the Bhagavad Gita. I just sort of stole the structure of that book and put a little bit of a twist on it. Mm. So the, the muse works in mysterious directions that way too. You know, you can be, you know, watching a movie that's about nothing that you even think about and suddenly you have an idea for something. So um, I know that, you know, that's kind of the way, the way you tap into stuff, you know, and it's, it's always there. It's like uh, Rick Rubin says, it's like the trade winds coming across from Hawaii, you know, there's always, it's always something. There's always a breeze coming in and there's always something on it. Do you also subscribe to the idea that Elizabeth Gilbert talks about, which is if you don't, if you don't follow through on that inspiration, that it's going to it's going to move on to someone else. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I won't say that, but uh, that may be true. But I thought what you were going to say was if you don't do it, uh, you get sick. It goes into your body. If you don't do it, that energy doesn't just dissipate. You know, it turn it goes into a darker channel. And the next thing you know, I mean, I know if I were to like stop, you know, for three days, five days, 20 days or something, I'd be into some bad stuff, you know, that energy would go into, you know, I'd be going out looking for trouble and good, good things would stop happening. Yeah. I've, I've actually equated it to your real health insurance, like following. Ah, yeah. That's through, great. Like yeah. following through on these internal urges from your heart voice, I call it is your real health insurance. And yeah. You, it reminds me of a conversation I heard you have with some other guy. I can't remember who the guy was, but this was maybe a few years ago. You were on somebody's podcast and he was talking about how he started this or he, he either he did it or he knew someone who started um, an organization that helps uh, late stage cancer patients fulfill dreams that they had had ah, in their yeah. own life. And then once, once they, enrolled in the painting class or the horse riding class or the gardening class or whatever, a lot of times they went into remission and they ended up living, you know, much longer than they were than their prognosis. And he theorized because it was because they were finally doing the thing that their heart had been urging them to do for, you know, sometimes decades. Yeah, that's actually, I forgot where I was, I was talking about that, but right up the hill behind me, the house right behind me used to belong to Tom Laughlin, the mm -hmm. actor, if you remember Billy Jack, it probably was before your time. So Tom Laughlin was uh, in his non-movie world, became a kind of a renegade Jungian therapist. Just, you know, he had no accreditation or whatever the word is. Um, and he became this kind of a guy that people would go to after they would tried everything else right? Nothing was working, right? Cancer was killing him. And this was his absolute theory. He felt like he would ask them, he would say, let's say a lady came in there and she had cancer or something. And she's 75 years old. And he'd say, was there ever a, a dream that you had when you were a young woman that you didn't follow through on? And a woman might say something like, you know, I always wanted to be a classical pianist. You know, I played until I was 18 or 20 and I got married and I stopped. And so what he would say to her, start again, immediately, rent, you know, a grand piano, take classes, go back for that dream. And his, and, and like you say, cancers would go into remission. And so his theory was that the reason you got the cancer in the first place was because you didn't live out that dream and that that energy, that creative energy was really like a child that wanted to be born inside you. And you hadn't allowed it to be born for whatever reasons you were afraid or whatever life overtook you. You had children, blah, blah, blah. And so he said, okay, let's cure this by re letting that creativity come through again. And, you know, I'm sure this wasn't scientific and God knows how, if it, if it worked for everybody, but apparently it worked for some people. And I, I certainly believe that in my own body. 
Yeah, and, and you, you refer to uh, the voices that, that kind of talk us out of doing these things initially as these diabolical tricks that resistance yeah, can Yeah, that's, that's the imposter them. syndrome. That's all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. and by the way, like, I follow you. You know, I listen, I follow your daily stuff. You know, uh, mm -hmm. you're, uh, you're one of three people that I follow every day. <laughs> How does one distinguish between the diabolical voice and the actual voice of inspiration or the muse voice? What, what are some of the, uh, well, symptoms? you know it when it's inspiration, cause it's good, you know, it's something positive, you know, and, uh, but, um, but it's tricky too, because you could be focusing, like I'm focusing on the keynote, but then back in my mind, I could make the argument that, oh, I should, I should, you know, post something on social media because you know, that's going to be yeah. that part of my thing. And then another voice is saying, uh, you know, you should go out for a walk because walking is great. And so like, <laughs> how do you, when you have yeah, a lot of these ideas, I mean, resistance is so diabolical that like it will latch on to legitimate things. Like mm -hmm. it is good to take a walk. <laughs> you know, it is good to, to maybe to post on social media. And if you do take a walk, you might, some great ideas might come to you, but you know, resistance is the devil. And it's really trying to get you to take a walk so that you won't sit down and do your work. How long have you been working on this keynote thing? Embarrassingly, um, I've, I've kind of been starting and stopping and stuff for about a, a year, year and a half. Oh, wow. Yeah. Let me ask you another thing, if you don't mind, Light. Please. As you, you know, you said that you're uh, uh, sort of trying to get on bigger stages and kind of expand mm -hmm. your, your footprint out there. What... Uh, What's what's behind that? And where do you see that going over the next, you know, three or four years? Well, I've given a lot of, um, you know, I've given a lot of talks on, on comparably smaller stages and I've seen the impact that it can have on people. And I just I, I'm, I have this this urge to to scale my message to get so that uh -huh. I can reach more people. It's the same reason why I write books now, because historically, I have been in these rooms with like 20 people and having these amazing experiences with these 20 people, but it's only impacting 20 people. Ah, uh, yeah. And, uh, uh -huh. and I just feel like I could be of more use. It's kind of uh, like when I was, when I was modeling, you know, I really, I really enjoyed modeling back in my early twenties. And, and then I started kind of researching and, and studying uh, Eastern philosophy and I just felt like, you know what, I, I could be using my voice and my talents a little bit more than I am right now standing in front of a camera. And so it's that same kind of feeling where I feel like I've graduated from this thing that I was doing. It doesn't mean it was a waste of time. It doesn't mean that I wasn't great at it and all of this, but I'm just feeling this pull towards something a little bit bigger. And I know it and it scares me. And that's another telltale sign that this is a direction that I need to go ah, in yeah, because yeah. I'm very comfortable in that room with 20 people, ah, but I'm yeah. a little bit nervous, you know, getting up in front of 2000 people. Ah, so, yeah. you know, so yeah, I just, I just, I've done that so many times throughout my life that I, I, I recognize the, the, the pulling effect. Ah, very interesting. Ah, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, like, again, what you, you talked about, we didn't talk about the Battle of Thermopylae, but that's another one of these sort of quotes, random ideas. Like you never set out to make a best selling book. You just kind of were following through step by step on these, on this pulling that you felt inside. Let's keep exploring. Let's go a little bit deeper. And then maybe at some point you have to take out that legal pad and write out the outline. Ah, right. Yeah. And then once you did that, you had to do something with it. Yeah. So I feel like we all kind of have our version of that, whether we show up to it or not, whether we say yes to it or not. But but the the blueprint is is pretty much the same. You know, getting the call and then the next, and then at some point you have to become a professional about it. Yeah, you do. I mean, I'm constantly on the lookout for whatever the next idea is. You know, as I'm working on one book. Um, I'm sort of got my, my antenna up for whatever the next idea is. And, uh, you know, I, I, I look at it in a, in a kind of a professional way. I'll, I, I think most people have a lot of ideas, but 
Uh, in other words, sometimes people say, oh, you creative people, you have a lot of ideas. But I think everybody has a lot of ideas in the shower, while you're driving, whatever, on the, in the subway. But I think what most people do is they dismiss them right away. You know, they'll say, ah, oh, that's a dumb idea or, oh, I could never do that. And it just sort of goes in one ear and out the other. Whereas I think, you know, a songwriter will catch just, you know, three notes or just a little riff or a little thing. And they'll go, oh, that's something. And they'll hang on to it and see if they can build a song around it. You know, they'll see it as kind of a, a germ of an idea. And I think it's the same with writers. You know, you'll have a character will come to you or a scene will come to you or just some small thing. That, that then you will build on. You know, a lot of analogy that I sometimes use is like, like writing a book to me is like unearthing a dinosaur. You know, you, you, you're out on a hike and you're looking at the ground and you see a little something peeking up from the ground and you kind of scrape the dirt away and you go, holy cow, this is a bone. You know, this is like a, a, a look. And then... But underneath that that dirt is an entire dinosaur. You know, it's like a hundred feet in every direction. And the process is sort of to just get out your little paintbrush and little by little by little expose it, you know, until you see the whole thing. But the point is to see it in the first place. Mm -hmm. you, you you have something in your in your uh, book. It says writers do not write to express themselves. They write to discover themselves, which is pretty juicy. So... What do you mean by that? Uh, is that more of a spiritual process? Of yeah, this will maybe this will plug into what you think about, like. But uh, one thing that was sort of amazing to me as I started writing books, which was like from 1995 or something like that, was that each book surprised me. You know, the idea surprised me. Like you we were talking about the Battle of Thermopylae. That was my second book, a book called Gates of Fire. And um, I just happened to be reading Herodotus and I came to this one paragraph and I just was hit like by a bolt of lightning that, ah, this is a story, you know, that just, you know, there's a whole story, the dinosaur bone, you know, this is something I could take and run with it. But at the time, I thought I never thought in a million years I would write on that subject. I knew nothing about it. I didn't even believe that it was going to be commercial. But uh, but I was just kind of seized by that idea to to take it. But the big point and that of uh, that and other books since then is they come as surprises. So when you say when I say that people write to discover who they are, they don't write to express themselves. They write to discover themselves. It's like when I had finished that book, I looked at it and I go, "Wow, that's me in some way, or that's a part of me." that I never knew existed. And that's the way it's sort of gone from then on. And the War of Art, you know, when that kind of came to me, when that was done, I, I never expected to do it. It was the last thing in the world I wanted to do. But when it was done, I said, that's another part of me. And so I do think that we write to discover ourselves. And even Socrates, you know, there's some passage in Socrates where he talks about that the artist at work doesn't know what he or she is doing. And I think that's absolutely true. I think the sculptor maybe has a general idea of what they're going to, you know, uncover when they work in the marble or whatever it is, but it just kind of evolves and it surprises them. And I think that's the way it should be. Does that ring any bell with, with you in your evolution or in the, in the world of meditation? Yeah, hundred percent. I, 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 you know, I keep going back since you're a student of the of the the Gita. Uh, maybe you could help break this down. But I keep going back to this that quote from the Gita, which I think refers to this, which is, "You have the, a right to perform your duties, but you're not you're not entitled to the fruits of your actions." Yeah, and, you have a right to your labor, but not to the fruits of your labor. Yeah, which I think and is I think, absolutely true and very very deep. I think a blurry line that a lot of creatives have is in creating for the sake of creating versus creating for recognition, yeah, or creating yeah, yeah. For, to raise your platform and your status. Yeah. Because those thoughts are there, man. We can't deny those yeah. thoughts are there. I want They're this there. to be a bestseller. I want people to like this. Yeah. I want to feel like I have some sort of idea of what's good and what's not good. 
but it's based on external validation. So how do you, how do you navigate that? Well, another thing, uh, it's, a, it's another great question, but another thing that I've found is that the things I've done that have succeeded the most were the ones that I thought had no chance of succeeding at all, that I thought were not commercial at all. Like, um, like Gates of Fire, for example, that's sold about a, a million copies, over a million copies. And I thought, this is a story about a battle that happened 2,500 years ago that practically nobody's heard of, can't pronounce it, can't spell it. It's another country. It's not America. You know how Americans, they only want to read about America. So I thought, who's going to be interested in this? I mean, nobody's going to be interested in this except me. I'm interested in it. So I thought, well, and I, and I knew that I wasn't going to make any money off of it because as a, when you write fiction, you have to write the whole book before you can you know, sell it. You can't just make a, write a proposal or something like that. So I thought, this is going to take me two years and nothing's going to come of it. But I just loved the idea. And, so, and it worked. It just happened to work. So on the other hand, when I've had an idea that I thought, ah, oh, this is a surefire success, those are the ones that completely bomb and, you know, nobody even, so I just, I, for me, I just sort of ask myself, do I love it? And that's the only criterion I go on. And Rick Rubin says the same thing. He says, you know, if a band gets into the studio and they're just trying to make a hit, that's not the attitude that brings, you know, the help from above, you know, the goddess doesn't like that attitude. Uh, whereas if they go in there to just make music that they love without, again, being attached to the fruits of your labor, um, those are the things that, that do well. And if they don't, at least you've done something for your soul. You know, you are true to yourself, which is what you always say. And I think it's true. Yeah, you have one of my favorite anecdotes from the War of Art is the King Kong Lives anecdote <laughs> that you guys, you wrote with your partner and had a yeah. whole premiere organized and nobody showed up and it was a horrible movie. <laughs> um, I, I, I totally understand that. And I still think it's, it's um, interesting to navigate you know, those thoughts, those sort of egoic thoughts around what you want the results to be. But I, what I take away from what you just said is just don't be attached to those thoughts. If they can be there, that's fine. But you're not doing it for that. And you're not, yeah. attached, you're not attached to that as you're, as you're sitting down every day and showing up. Yeah. The work. But, you know, it took me three and a half years to write my first book, which is a self-published book. So I didn't have any real like professional guidance. And how do you know when a project is done? How do you know when it's ready for, um, for the public? Uh, I think you just, you just know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm a believer. I do a lot of drafts. I'll do like 15 drafts. And, uh, at some point you just say to yourself, I can't stand doing another one of these things. You know, it's, uh, it's time to let it go. And I, I also, I, I, I had an agent years ago. And um, his name was Bart Fless. And he, I was like in my late 20s and he was in his 70s or something. So he seemed older than God to me. But he used to say when I come towards the end of something, and by the way, he never sold anything. I never sold anything. He never made a dime. Um, but he would say, you know, how close are you? How close? And I would say, I'm close. I'm close. And he would say, give it to me. Close is good enough, you know. And I, I think there's, there's a lot to that. You know, you can, because perfectionism, is definitely a form of resistance. And, you know, wanting to do it over and over and over, you know, it's just a way of, because you're afraid of getting it out there and afraid of being judged. Uh, so, yeah, it, to me, it's pretty obvious when it's ready to go. Can we talk about your very first book, the one you finished, the first one you finished? So you were 31 uh, years old, you finished this book, right? And you said that you could, you wrote that you couldn't find a buyer for it. And this is, you know, I guess, I don't know what year this was, but it was way before Amazon. Nowadays, you can self-publish a book on Amazon. And I'm wondering, for those people who are, who are out there who wrote something and they can't find a buyer for it, do you recommend, is there value to just putting something out there if you, you couldn't find a buyer? Or, or, um, or how do you sort of, in, how do you sort of uh, interpret that kind uh, of situation? That's a good question. I never thought about that before. I mean, 
Certainly in the old days when there were gatekeepers, i.e. publishing houses and editors who would tell you, hey, this sucks, you know, this isn't good enough. You just accepted that. It's not good enough to be published. Um, so I think there is something to self-publishing, something like that. At least you got it out there. But um, it also can be a negative because, like I'm thinking about this book of mine that I did finish that time. It's a good thing I didn't publish it because it just, it just wasn't good enough. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of of two, of two minds. I mean, I think that somebody could write a book, their first book, and it would be good enough to share with the world. That's a long, long, long shot, you know? I mean, you did it, but uh, I certainly didn't. Um, it, it, it's like anything else. It takes a while, you know? If you're playing a, a musical instrument, how long do you have to play the piano before you can actually perform on a stage? And that also, I think, the idea of self-publishing is a little bit of an insecurity thing and a little bit of an ego thing, which... It might, as, I think as long as you just sort of put it out there and just said, okay, I'm not attached to the result, let it go, I'll just put it out there, um, then then I think maybe that's okay. But if you put it out there and it's like, uh, oh man, I hope I hope this is great, I hope people buy it, then, you know, that's, that's not the best place to be coming from. I was saying that my first book, um, which took me three and a half years, when I look back at the first couple of drafts, when I... And, I, and the reason it took me so long is because I would take these long breaks. I didn't, I didn't understand. I'm it was, sure, I'm it was sure you did. Book. Everybody does. Yeah. <laughs> it was that Which book. Which is that, why, as I said, you can't take breaks. Yeah. You know? you're yeah. An, no, that book is an amateur that, thing to do. That book led me to the War of Art. That's how I finished the book. Is oh, uh, really? A friend of mine uh, suggested the War of Art and I oh, read really? it. And then after that, I realized, oh, I've been an amateur with this endeavor. I need to become a professional and I started showing up and and I even put some money on the line. I sent my my friend of mine a check for four thousand dollars and said, hey, if I don't finish by this date, which was three months from that point, um, then you can cash this check. So, of wow. course, once I once I put some skin in the game and had stakes and everything, um, I was able to finish the book. No problem. Uh, that, within, that's a great uh, way to do it. I never thought about that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Good for you, Light. Yeah. But, you know, something you talked about with uh, your friend Randall Wallace, who wrote what was my favorite movie for many years, Braveheart? Um, you asked him about his his research for the movie, and he said, "I don't I don't do any research," <laughs> which was interesting because that's such a historical film. But the 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 uh, deeper answer is, you can do research, but you don't do research until draft seven, eight. You know, you, until the later drafts. You don't start because doing research is a form of resistance, which is completely counterintuitive. But it's exactly true, right? If you, as long as you're doing research, you think you're actually working. You go, oh, I'm working on the book, I'm really, but in fact, you're avoiding writing it. And uh, I'll tell you one little story, I might even have told you this, like, but uh, I wrote a book called um, The Lion's Gate a few years ago, and it involved a lot of research in Israel. It was about uh, the Six Day War, the 1967 war. And I came back, I interviewed like 75 fighter pilots and tankers and stuff like that. And I came back with like 400 hours on tape. So I thought to myself, uh, well, I got to be a historian about this. I got to do this right. So let me transcribe every, every interview and then I'll boil it all down just like a you know, professor would do. And this went on for about three months. And I was getting absolutely nowhere, you know. And one day I just said to myself, you know, just write the fucking thing, you know. And uh, that immediately cured everything. I just kind of plunged in and just started because I, I, had, I, I was so familiar with the interviews that I had them all in my head. I didn't really need to like, you know, uh, anyway, that was research versus writing and just doing the writing. And then I, you can go back and check the research. You know, I'd write a chapter about a certain pilot and I go, did I get that right? And then I'd read over what you know, the interview was like, oh, okay, I'll fix this and fix that. Um, but as Randy Wallace says, when he said he didn't do research, he says, uh, get the story first, like the story of Braveheart. You know, he sort of blocked it out. Okay, it's going to start here at the middle here. And the end is going to be here. Okay, that's the story I want to tell. And then, 
you know, you can start to, to, to look up the real you know, William Wallace and what really, really happened. And if you're really doing it right, when history clashes with your own story, dump the history, you know, stick with the story that you're going to tell. Yeah, I was watching the um, Aaron Sorkin masterclass on that platform, uh, masterclass. I watch that too. That's a great one. Yeah. And he was talking about social network and, you know, obviously it wasn't exactly how things went, but he was focusing on the human aspects of the story. And, and yeah. you, get, you can nail those. You can always fill in the facts and the details as you see them and bring the story to life. But if you're just reading fact after fact after fact after fact, then it's not that interesting of a story. Yeah, then it becomes an academic treatise. And that's there's value to that, too. But, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think when someone sees a movie like The Social Network, they realize it's not what exactly happened. You know, we just want a good story. You know, and in some way, maybe Aaron Sorkin's version of that is truer than the real but what really happened, you know? So if, to anybody that's writing fiction out there, don't be too wedded to the, the real story of the facts. The facts get in the way. What is your approach with fiction versus nonfiction? Because you mentioned with uh, the Gates of Fire that you had these, these two lines that came to you and you knew that's how I'm going to start the book. Did oh, you yeah, do the that's same actually thing? was a different book, The Virtues of War, but uh, okay. Is that something you do with with nonfiction as well? You kind of have a concept or an anecdote that you start with, or do you start with an outline, the, the legal um, paper? It's anecdote? a good question. I mean, I haven't, the, the only real long nonfiction I've done is this Lions, the Lions Gate that, that where I did all the tons of research in Israel. Mm -hmm. So, but then if you want the kind of the long answer, I'll give you the long answer here. Like yeah. this, is, so I, I have all this sort of raw material that I've been working on through interviews for this book, right? And it's true. And because people have died, real people have died, you know, this is, you know, I can't just wing it. I can't make up shit. I've got to be true to the reality of the thing. But I, so I ask myself the kind of the questions that you ask yourself of a work of fiction. Like if we were writing The Godfather, it's totally fiction. So you ask yourself, First, what's the theme? What is this about? You know, and uh, for and, and you try to go deep. It's not just about a surface story. It's like what's really underneath it. Like for me, the story of, of the Six Day War in Israel was about a return from exile. So just like you would do in a piece of fiction. And and then I applied all of the tests that I would apply to a, to a work of fiction, a work of the imagination you know, theme, hero, villain, what's the climax? And uh, once I, I knew those, then I said, okay, I'll just use this raw material and and tell the story, you know, with a, an inciting incident, an act two midpoint and a climax, just like I would do with a, with a piece of fiction, even though the characters were real and the events were real. And by the way, uh, any, if we had had a hundred other writers who had done this exact same research, they would have written a hundred different books and each one is valid. It's just a question sort of of what, what struck your soul, what you saw out of the, out of that raw material. Uh, we're kind of veering into a uh, writing workshop. Ah. Zone, which, which you have you have a writing workshop coming up so I, I, if you if it's okay with you i'd like to ask you a few questions just sure, about please do about the craft even though you're not going to cover the craft in your workshop you can cover more mindset stuff but i'm imagining people listening to this they may have ideas about writing something and i wanted to ask you when it comes to writing particularly fiction if there's someone out there who's thinking of an idea that they want to put on paper and they get inspired by this conversation to overcome their resistance just just in terms of thinking of heroes and villains right i and and what's 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 triggered this this uh question is i saw a video the other day where this i forget what author it was but he was saying that the, what makes a good hero is someone who's got a flaw and i think that's something that's a little counterintuitive like the hero has to have a flaw and there's got to be something in the plot that allows the hero to confront their flaw and I was curious to hear your your perception perspective on heroes and villains and what makes a good hero 
what makes a good villain? Ah, uh, well, I'm I'm not necessarily a believer in that flaw thing. Um, I think hero, villain, and theme are all absolutely yoked together, right? Um, if we, to me, what what and this I got this from Robert McKee, and I think it's absolutely true. What really makes a hero is a hero is willing to sacrifice himself or herself for the sake of a greater cause. Whereas a villain will never do that. That's why Trump is such a classic villain, because he will never sacrifice himself for anything other than his own self. And if you think about the great James Bond villains and or anything like that, or even a villain like the shark in Jaws or the, the alien, the only thing they care about is themselves, right? They only want to eat, keep feeding, conquer, you know, whatever it is. So, so I think that's one thing. The, uh, the, the hero is willing to sacrifice him or herself or their, or their chance of happiness or whatever it is for, for a greater cause. And the other thing about a hero to me is that a hero is willing to go, this I got from Robert McKee as well, and it's absolutely true, willing to go to the absolute end of the line, you know, to give everything that they that they possibly can, which is why so many stories are life and death stories. Um, so if you think about it, a, a movie like Casablanca, I'm sure probably 99% of, of our audience here has never heard of Casablanca, but uh, I hope they have. But if you think about hero, villain, and theme, the theme of Casablanca is it's better to expend yourself in a, in a greater cause than to seek a life of selfish fulfillment. So the hero of the movie is Humphrey Bogart, and the villain are, is the Nazis. And the question is, can this really good couple, Ilsa Lund and her, and her husband, played by uh, Paul Henried, the, the resistance, the brave French resistance fighter, can they escape from Casablanca and continue their good work fighting the war? And how they're going to get out is through these uh, letters of transit that Humphrey Bogart holds in his hand. And, then, and he's in love with, with, with Ingrid Bergman, with Ilsa. So at the end of the movie, he sacrifices his love for her, and he puts her on the plane to Lisbon, to freedom, with her husband. So he's giving up. So, you know, his own personal happiness, letting go the girl he loves for the greater good. And that is a kind of a classic hero, villain and theme all working together. I've been following you since 2014. Um, you've become very prolific with your social media shares over the last um, several years. And you've got a weekly newsletter called Writing Wednesdays. You promote books that have inspired you on your um, on your social media. And in your most recent book, The Daily Press Field, you are referring to all the books you've written, but you also refer to Writing Wednesdays and you refer to this retreat that you've done before. And you've got another retreat that's coming up where you're going to be a guest presenter. It's going to be in Malibu. It's going to be in September of 2024. Um, and you said you're not going to be talking about the craft. You're going to be talking about the mindset. Is that because you feel like mindset is more important than craft? Uh, it's because I think there are a lot of people who could be, who are a lot more articulate and know a lot more about the craft of writing than I do. But I do think that I understand the mindset as well as anybody. Um, and when I'm talking about the mindset, and you know about this exactly, if, if you're sitting down to write a novel, let's say, or a long-form nonfiction piece or a long-form TV or a, or a record album or something that's going to take two years, and you're basically alone going into a room every day to face your demons every day, you have to have a very specific, no bullshit mindset, you know, to keep you going. And I think people, and this is, certainly was true of me when I started out, start out with the best of intentions, with all kinds of passion, but they can't make it to the end of the line because they don't have, there's so many pitfalls out there that they're not aware of. 
emotional pitfalls, your own demons, your own self-sabotage, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what this retreat is about. It's I, I, I want to try to, in my mind, it's sort of like an, if we had an audience of people who wanted to try out for the Navy SEALs, and I was a Navy SEAL, I'd have to tell them, you better get your head and ass wired together right now, you know? And I want to make it clear to people how hard it's going to be and what exactly the pitfalls are so that when they come up against them, they don't freak out and they don't quit so that they go in with a, a realistic mindset of how hard it's going to be. And uh, even right down to uh, like what Robert Green likes to talk about is the tedium of a long work, piece of work. You know, you're not excited. You're not fired up every day. There's a period in there that's like the middle of the NFL season, you know, where you're going from game seven to game 14, right? And you're just grinding it out through the middle of the season. So in any event, that's, so that's why I wanted to talk about the mindset, because I think that's what I do understand and, and what I can help people with, I think. How did you link up with, uh, is it Rhoda? Rhoda Ahmed? Yeah, Rhoda Ahmed, yeah. It's her idea. She's the one who sort of said, let's do this together. I mm -hmm. could never do it myself. She's the sort of the uh, genius behind making it all happen, you know, um, finding a place to do it, you know, all the organizational stuff. And she has a whole concept about uh, that, it, that it's silent. You know, you're not allowed to ask me questions until the very end of the thing. And when, when you do, uh, there are little breaks where you write, you know, where you have a take a was an hour to write, and you're not allowed to talk, and nobody's allowed to talk to you. And that's her idea. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Is this your first one with her, or have you done yeah, it before? Uh, the only, I've only done this once before, and that was in a real half-assed way. So I've never done it in a, in a real serious way. And I may never do it again, but this is the first one. I'm kind of like you, Light. I'm sort of expanding to a slightly higher level of... Uh, self-exposure how, how does it feel uh being as prolific on on social media and, and podcasts and stuff over these last couple of years do you like the way that feels or yeah it's, is, fun. Is it's there... fun actually i'm really doing it in partnership with my girlfriend diana that you know and she's right out that window right there and in, the, in her own little cabin working um and she's the one who films everything and edits everything and and you know cracks the whip over me and that kind of thing so without her it's sort of, it's a, it's a group effort, her, her and me. And we've kind of found a voice. I think that's, uh, you know, it's not making very much money, but it's fun. So uh, it, like you, Light, you know, I, I think, how many of these have I got in me before I totally run out of ideas? But, you know, the box is always something in the box, right? So there's always another thing to say. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. Okay. So your the retreat's going to be on September the 7th. Um, I'm just looking at the schedule. looks like you're going to be giving um, presentations for a couple of hours and then breaks and another couple hour presentation and then break yeah. and then writing immersion. Who's, who's, um, Who's the ideal participant in this? Ah, that's, that's a great this. question. Um, okay, I'm not going to actually use this person's name, but um, this guy has has written a book that was actually a hit. Um, he's uh, been very successful in other fields, uh, but like maybe a couple of years ago, he's a friend of mine. He told me he had this idea for a book, and I could tell he was terrified to write this thing. It was very important to him. You know, it was one of those things that like, oh, my God, if I fail at this, my whole life goes down in flames. So he's been sort of defeated by his own resistance over the last couple of years. And uh, but he's obviously he, lo he loves this. Anyway, he's the perfect person because he's already a pro. If, if he's given the right mindset and the right inspiration, which he's already done at once, then maybe he'll he'll go out of maybe he'll come out of this, you know, one day session. He'll go, oh my god, damn it! I, 
if Pressfield can do it, I could do it too, you know, and sit down and do it. Uh, so it's, it, this is definitely not for dilettantes. It's not for somebody that's just kind of, you know, playing around or sightseeing. This is for somebody that, that, uh, is capable of, of, of putting in this long-term effort, but is somehow uh, uh, still fighting their own imposter syndrome and distraction and all that sort of stuff. And this hopefully would be like a kick in the ass to, to get them rolling. Yeah. And you also, you talk about, you write about how the resistance never goes away. You're still experiencing it all these Absolutely. decades later. And, um, and so can, Considering the fact that you 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 understand that and you are good at showing up, is there something else that like what's the next level? What's layer two of okay? I'm showing up. I understand there's resistance. What's the next level of creation that one needs to be aware of? Um, I think showing up is ninety nine percent of it. Light, you know. I mean, there's there's really. Two parts to it, I think any any creative person would say this, a dancer, a photographer, a filmmaker. The one part is is the goddess, is the inspiration of being open to, uh, you know, when a song comes into your head that you pull over to the side of the freeway and you write it down, you know, or you're, and you're open to it. You don't just blow it off and say, oh, that's just something. And then the other half is the professionalism half of just simply showing up every day and... Um, uh, you know, it's sort of like, uh, as a meditation, you know, my, uh, my trainer, T.R. Goodman, who I think, you know, I think we, he's, uh, quite a spiritual dude who is, uh, definitely meditates at a really deep level every day for hours. And one of the things he talks about, and I'm, I know you, you believe this too, is that as you get to a higher level of inspiration, the, the, the frequency of the vibrations that are coming into you get higher and higher and higher, right? You're getting better stuff from the universe and you need to sort of train your body, your instrument, your radio to be able to take that voltage. And I think that's, that's the other half of the professionalism as a writer or as a creative person is that when the ideas do start coming, that you can, you can handle them. You know, you know how to, how to uh, hit the keyboard and make it happen or hit the piano keys and, and get it down there. Uh, so it's a two, a two part thing beyond the showing up, but showing up is 99% of it. I think, I think if you show up, help comes to you. Just, just being there wins the favor of the goddess. She gives you a lot of points for that. You know, I, I would also, just from my own experience, I would add that, and I know you're, you're probably familiar with this as well is, is just the practice of not judging it too much. You yeah. Know? Like you could be yeah. there and you could be writing and you'd be thinking this is not great. Yeah. And that's fine, but still keep writing and still keep showing up. And, and that's a great one. I'm really glad you brought that up. That's absolutely true. Not judging it, turning off the self censor. You know, because mm -hmm. that again that's is another form of resistance. That sort of perfectionism of, oh, I didn't get that, you know, comma in the right place. Let me, you know, yeah. So people have asked me um, in my meditation work, where's the strangest place that I have ever meditated? And I've got this whole story about meditating in a New York City dry cleaner in the changing room. And it's really funny and all that. And I've heard you talk about, you know, speaking of showing up, I've heard you talk about one of the strangest circumstances that you've experienced is you had some medical condition where you couldn't wear pants or underwear. Oh, yeah. You're literally standing up, writing naked with a fan blowing on your balls. <laughs> Would you <laughs> say exactly that that's one of your, was that one of your most bizarre showing that's up? That's the most bizarre, yeah. It's exactly true. I, yes, had, yes. I had two infections simultaneously. I had a staph infection and a, and a yeast infection right down where the sun don't shine, you know? And they had to, the, the treatment for it was that you had to have circulation of air, you know? So, but I wasn't going to stop working. So I just worked, you know, standing up and, you know, for a couple of weeks, wrote some good stuff too. Which project? Do you remember which project you were working on? I don't on so we remember can appreciate which project. It. No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> it just goes to show you, you know, it's a, you know, there's a new trolley coming down the track every day. 
Yeah. And, and, and something else you all, you, you've said that I think it's really good to, to remind the listener of is that the intensity of the resistance someone experiences is in direct correlation to the, um, importance of the dream or calling that they're experiencing to be brought into the material, um, yeah, Maybe. that's that's that is a great a true principle to me. It's a principle just like uh, Newton's third law of thermodynamics. You know, it's a, it's a law of nature, and and uh, we can use that to our advantage. In that, when we're we're inspired by an idea that's really important to the evolution of our soul, forget about whether it's commercial or not. You know, a piece of music or a dance or whatever it is, if it's really really important to us we will feel tremendous resistance, tremendous fear, tremendous imposter syndrome, all that sort of stuff. Um, so we can use that fear to encourage ourselves because if, the, if we didn't have that big fear or that big fear is an indication of a big dream. So it means we absolutely have to do it. Uh, big, big dream equals big resistance. What's the best way for someone to find out more about this writing retreat, the Silent Writers Retreat? Uh, there's a, a website, and it's called www.silentwritingretreat.com. All one word, no caps. And uh, that will uh, that's how you sign up for it, or you put your name on the list. Actually, Rhoda and I were kind of going over. We've got like about about 500 applicants for 50 places so far. So, of course, people don't know how much it costs. So they, when they find out how much it costs, that may self-select a lot of people out. But that, that uh, address that I just gave you, that link is uh, how, to find, how to sign up and, and get more information. How do you um, think about cost? Think about the, the, the idea of exchange when it comes to creativity and maybe you can even say a calling do you think that there's a correlation there in terms of is that um, a, a, this is kind sign of a new one for me i'm sure you've thought about this a lot right mm -hmm. uh because you i don't know what do you charge for your workshops and you know people have to fly da, 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 da. and i'm you know most creative people i think and i'm one of them tend to undercharge right you tend to undervalue your your stuff right but recently for me i've kind of flipped over and uh and i and i've come to think that you know this stuff is worth is worth a lot you know and um so uh i don't think it's it's uh, out of line to charge what you think it's worth i also imagine you probably get hit up for consultations for people who are experiencing resistance is that is that true do you get do That's people reach out to you i help maybe two people <laughs> yeah <laughs> Because as you know, you can't do that. You know, you just, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. And again, I sort I won't charge for, for that. But I know that people that do charge will charge, you know, really a lot of money. And uh, but I, I, don't, I don't want to do that. So the bottom line is I basically say no. That's not what I'm here for. I'm a writer. I'm not here to coach people. Well, you do you do coach people through your Wednesday newsletter, yeah. And um, and and I love the way that you even frame the messages. You always write as if we're all right on the same level of creative as you are. You say, you know, we need to show up and be okay being alone, and you know, as you and I, as writers, and you know, I think that's really beautiful and special. So it feels kind of like you're being inadvertently coached by you if you just ah. subscribe to your newsletter, which is completely free. And what's also cool about your newsletter is that it has a comment section below because it links to a blog post. So people can actually leave feedback and, and exchange messages yeah. with one another and, you know, support one another in that way. Yeah. But I really, I do believe really that we're all, you know, soldiers in the trenches, you know, and, Maybe somebody's at the start of their journey and somebody's, you know, 30 years into it. Um, but like, just as you were saying before, resistance never diminishes and never goes away. And I'm sure that Aaron Sorkin fights it every day. In fact, you know the story about him that he takes like eight showers a day. Have you heard that one? 
No, I haven't heard this. He, he apparently, when he gets kind of stuck on his writing, he feels like, okay, let me rinse myself off. And he literally will go take a shower and then go come back and sit down. And sometimes he'll take like eight showers a day in a writing day. So apparently resistance strikes even Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> do you have your version of that? Is there a thing that you do to kind of get things going I do. Again? I do laundry. That's my thing. Okay. <laughs> I take a break and you'll do, a, do a, you know, I'll fold the laundry or whatever. Mm, wonderful. Well, look, um, I'm excited that you are making yourself available for people to come and be in the same room with you, which I think it's a pretty big deal, you know, to be in the room with the, the, the David Goggins of writing, <laughs> Stephen freaking Pressfield. This, oh, this retreat is actually outdoors. Like we're outdoors in a beautiful place. Well, to be in the same space with you and yeah. to be able to hear you yeah. in, in the flesh. And well, I'll um, let you know if, if, if I ever want to do it again. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, for those people who, who are inspired to sign up, there's, you got 500 people ahead of you for 50 slots. So you don't, don't uh, let resistance make you procrastinate too much. You definitely want to, uh, to, to be a person of action. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for making the time to come back onto the podcast. Is there a book in the pipeline as well uh, that's coming out soon or are you still in process of... Uh... Uh... There's one that's a, a, a novel that's with my agent now that uh, we'll see if he works, see if we can find a publisher. Um, this book here came out a couple of years ago called The Man at Arms. And um, it's uh, set in the ancient world. And uh, the hero is my uh, favorite character, Telemann, the one man killing machine of the ancient world. And the, the book that's coming out soon if we hope, is a follow-up to this book. So anyway, thanks very much for having me on, Light. It's always great to hang out with you. Don't you have your own publishing company? Yeah, but I and think for a, like a serious novel, I, I, I want to do it with, a, a, you know, a mainstream publisher. Hmm. It's it's too hard to, to, uh, to get to that fiction audience as hmm. a kind of a self-published thing. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you. Wishing you the best of luck with all of that. And, uh, and you're still, you know, one of my biggest inspirations. So I'll be, hey, you are for me, like, thank you for uh, your preparation on this and, and for, uh, you know, taking the time to, to be, you know, to really try to dig in deep here. And uh, I hope I see you in person before too long. Absolutely. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.